And on our panel tonight, one of the leading Brexiteers on the Conservative backbenches, Jacob Rees-Mogg. Does the panel agree with David Cameron that it is selfish to give the public sector a pay rise? I think you've got to work out where we started from, that when the Conservatives got in in 2010, a Labour minister said there is no money left. The deficit was £150 billion. Things had to be done that were difficult and unpopular and were difficult for the people suffering from them. Nobody wants to have a situation where hard-working people aren't getting pay increases. The government doesn't do this because it's unkind. It does it because we had to get the public finances in order. Do you realise that debt interest that we pay every year is now more than the wage bill for the NHS? That's the scale of the problem. And the government then has choices, and we as voters have choices. If you want to increase pay in the public sector, you have to work out where the money comes from. It could come uh, from increased taxation. But we currently have the highest level of tax as a percentage of GDP that we've had since the uh, late 1960s. The top 3,000 taxpayers pay as much in income tax as the lowest 9 million taxpayers. There is only a certain amount that you can get from them. So if that's can... true, what do you make of what's been going on this week, which is the Foreign Secretary, Boris Johnson, and Michael Gove, two senior yes. members of the... Say, hinting or I'll, saying directly I will that, come to should, that, but it's that really the government important, should give way? It's really important to look at the options, because that's one option, is increased taxation. The other is that we borrow more and our children pay for it. Now, having just had another child, I don't think it's really fair that the first thing I should say to him is you're going to pay to make my political life a little bit easier. And the third thing you can do is reallocate from other priorities. Um, somebody mentioned HS2. I happen to agree that that would not be my priority for spending. I personally... <laughs> I personally would raid the overseas aid budget, which I think is too big. And, uh, and, and, and I look forward to the £10 billion a year net that we will get back once we leave the European Union. So that... What do you make of what seems to be going on in government at the moment with these voices saying she should give way, she should be more liberal in the public sector pay? But I, I mentioned Boris Johnson, I mentioned Michael Gove. Well, you have to look at public sector pay in amongst these choices and in amongst what will be happening to the economy. But I'm if asking we get, about the government. Yes, that's is, right. But let me, they got one voice or six voices? They have one voice because they're bound by collective responsibility. They're not doing very well, and, that's it. Well, right. um, we have a former spokesman who knows how difficult it is sometimes to get I do. Uh, everybody singing quite in tune, though it's probably best if politicians don't sing. Uh, but the government understands that these difficult choices are there. What Boris um, Johnson and Michael Gove has been saying is that they are recognising that there is a pressure and that this leads to the debate that we are having now. But ladies and gentlemen, ultimately it's up to you. Which of those choices do you want to make? Do you want to risk even higher taxes? Do you want to risk higher borrowing? Or would you go with what would be my solution and reallocate from other areas that are, to right. my mind, a lower priority. Firstly, I'd like to congratulate Jacob on the birth of his sixth Thank child. Um, <laughs> but I also want to ask him, obviously he can afford to clothe, feed and educate six children. What does he have to say about the nurses and other members of the NHS who can't afford to feed themselves and, and house themselves as well? All right. Uh, well, OK, Jacob, you answer that. And then... Uh, uh, yes. Else. Um, there is a slight misunderstanding, I think, that the pay cap doesn't mean that people aren't getting any pay rises, that there are grade increments, and the average level five nurse has received a 3.8% increment increase on top of the 1% guideline increase. So where the cut has been is on a new entrant. So if you were a new entrant in 2010 and a new entrant now, you get 5% less in real terms than you did in 2010. But as in the period that you've been working for the NHS, you will have got grade increments 
you will not have had that real right. terms pay cut. And, and that's a very important point. Um, on, the, on my own personal affairs, which I don't think are very relevant, no, well, uh, but I will answer because I've been challenged. I've been yeah. challenged. It's only fair that I answer. I take no personal living expenses at all that MPs are entitled to. I have always refused to take those because I don't think that you should subsidise my lifestyle because I can afford it. And that was my decision, but other MPs are not in that position and they ought to get uh, an right. amount to help them with second homes and, and so on. Uh, thank you. Should we reduce or scrap the foreign aid budget to help solve funding issues closer to home? Well, I can give a one-word answer, yes. Um, I, th I think there are real problems. Sorry, they can't give a one-word answer because it was reduce or scrap. Well, it should be reduced or scrapped, but it reduced. I, 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 would, I would maintain... All right, I would maintain emergency relief, which I think only the government can do. Uh, and I think... There are some elements of the overseas aid budget where money has been very well spent. The money on um, camps near Syria to provide people with a place of refuge when they are fleeing in fear of their lives, I think is something we should be proud of what our country has done. Um, sponsoring the Ethiopian Spice Girls and the various other things where money has gone are not money well spent. And I think that should be done by, ladies and gentlemen, your private charity. All of you, I expect, give to charity, and you can choose. It's not for politicians to take your money in general taxation <laughs> and give it to charitable causes. But if you want development, and my background is as an emerging markets investor, what you want to help countries succeed is trade. South Korea is the most wonderful and impressive nation. After the Korean War, its GDP per capita was lower than Somaliland. It is now an OCD, OECD nation. It's one of the 30th richest countries in the world. And it's done that by trade, because we were willing to buy their goods. And mm. that's a great opportunity to come to a subject we may come to later, mm. once we're out of the European Union, and take away all the customs tariffs that we impose still on developing nations to help them boost themselves but by selling you, um, us things we want. Yeah, and, and Peter Bright's question was... Uh, to help solve funding issues closer to home. Are you arguing that we should cut the 13 billion that goes abroad and use it for the nurses and for the teachers? Well, you've got to be very careful Just because I don't want to fall into the trap of spending the same money many times. And you may notice that politicians do this. They say cut the overseas aid budget and then they're going to pay for nurses and teachers and a new hospital and more money on the defence services and so on and so forth. So I think you've got to work out what your choice is, where would you put it? And where would you? And I think at the moment I would put it into housing. I think that is the <laughs> greatest <laughs> issue facing our nation, um, obviously following what happened in Grenfell Tower, and I think there is going to need to be significant government expenditure in that area, and I think that would be a sensible way to find it and apply it. Um, given that 48% voted Remain, why is a hard Brexit being seen as the will of the people? You are either in the European Union or you leave it. And this is... <laughs> and this is... This is not only my view, this is the view of Donald Tusk, one of the presidents of the European Union, who said there is no such thing as hard and soft Brexit, there is being in the European Union or out. And if we're out of the European Union, we cannot have our laws determined by the European Court of Justice. We cannot have all our regulations set by being in the internal market. And we can't lose all our trading opportunities by being in the customs union. And this was clear at the election. I brought a quotation in case this came up from Wolfgang Schäuble, a very senior German politician. And he let the cat out of the bag after the referendum because he said he'd been asked to say this by uh, one George Osborne, the then Chancellor. And he said, if the majority in Britain opt for Brexit, that would be a decision against the single market. In is in, out is out. We knew what we were voting for. We voted <laughs> and democracy, and democracy must deliver. Now, what Sir Craig was talking about with companies, that's then our own immigration policy. We could have an immigration policy that makes it easy for senior executives to come in and go, or we could have a lunatic one that stops them coming in. But that's got nothing to do with being in the European Union. Indeed, we could have a better one because we could have the same for Americans and Australians and Indians as we have for Belgians and Romanians and Bulgarians. 
And that would be our choice. It would be nothing to do with the EU. And we can deal with inflation because we have very high tariffs on food and on clothing and on footwear. So the word hard them, Brexit doesn't actually mean anything to you? A hard Brexit is a term used by people who don't want us to lose the, leave the European Union and regret the result. And that they is, pretend that there is a soft is, Brexit. Jacob, you said Jacob, you've said something tonight that's simply not true. You're saying it's absolutely binary and that you can't leave the EU and actually have some of the benefits of it. Well, you can. You could decide to have the ECJ, the European Court of Justice, have some jurisdiction. You could choose to have the customs unit. Now, I've been told that in government, they understand that you would have to increase trade with far-flung markets by 4,000% to balance the problems of leaving the customs union in the single market. You are taking people for fools if you are claiming that it is just simply a binary decision and it's not going to have any impact on our economy because it is already. This is terminological inexactitude. The truth is that if we still have our laws determined by the European Court of Justice, then our Parliament is no longer able to make all our laws and the votes of the British people do not count because our laws are made and interpreted that by a foreign nonsense. court. We're under the, the ECJ, ECJ now and we make We laws. are under the ECJ now and we voted to leave. Nonsense. We cannot allow our law to be overturned by Brussels if we have left the European <laughs> Union. It is... It, it is... It is not only... Jacob, we said... It is not only a binary decision, it is a most obviously binary one. Who your judges are, who interprets your law, is fundamental Jacob. to whether you are an independent Jacob. nation we or not. Said, we we set tax in this country, we set security in this country, defence, education, health. Once you get well, I'm past glad that, let, there is just very word, little okay. that the European... The okay, European well, I'm, I'm so glad it. that we set tax in this country. We can't set the tax rate on women's sanitary uh, items because that's determined by the European S Union. S S just on that, on that point of, a, of, a, of, a, of the people having a second say, a referendum, and I'll come well, to you, say say on the deal. It's not a second this, say, it's a first say on the deal. A first say on this the deal. This is characteristic of the EU. Vote in the way that Brussels doesn't like and you have to vote again until you've done what they tell you. Uh, it, it seems to me we had a referendum, we decided to leave, and that must be implemented or we deny democracy. Should people leave university with £50,000 worth of debt? We all keep saying about Theresa May with a magic money tree with your accuse her of. I think that Labour must have a magic money forest. Because all this stuff they're giving away is unbelievable. <laughs> Jacob. I think that gentleman's made the best comment of the night. I, I, it's very hard to follow. Um, uh, I think that the, the point you were making, David, is absolutely the key one, that there's been a 72% increase in applications to university from people from the most disadvantaged backgrounds. And the reason for that is that loans have allowed the number of places at university to increase because they are funded by the loans rather than directly by the government. But what matters is the term of the loan. So yes, there is this large nominal debt, but it only begins to be paid back after people earning over £21,000. It is then written off after 30 years. It does not count on people's credit score, and it is collected through the tax system. So there will be a 9% collection above £21,000. Nobody will have to pay all of that back. There will be no debt collectors knocking on your door if you can't pay it back, my door. I didn't get uh, a degree. After, the only after, person here who didn't need to get a degree. After 30 years, it is simply written off and it is taken through PAYE. And that means that it ought to be no disincentive to people to go. And you've seen numbers rise. But let's just look briefly at what they do in Scotland. Because in Scotland, it's free. But where have they paid for that from? They've paid for it from further education. So the people who are going to be the elite who are going to earn over their careers £200,000 more, are being paid for by those who are going to further education, who are going to have fewer opportunities. That seems to me to be outrageous. And you have to decide who pays. Is it going to be the people, under very favourable terms, who will benefit? Or is it, ladies and gentlemen, going to be people on the minimum wage who are just beginning to pay tax? All right. That is a choice we the have to face. The woman in the second row. 